So first of all, just a quick introduction to your presenters today. My name's Hannah. I'm one of the senior HR advisors within the Agilio Software IT. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm uh, talking to our members on the helpline, supporting them with um, their HR queries. So it's great to see so many members uh, that I recognize today joining us. And I'm also joined today by my colleague, Sophie. Thanks, Hannah. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Employment Law Update webinar. Um, I am, my name's Sophie in the Agilio I-Team, one of your I-Team advisors, um, predominantly working on the HR helpline, supporting our members, as well as our I-Team members as well. So we're going to have a look, first of all, at the session content for today's Employment Law Update. So it's predominantly going to be um, employment law um, update that will go with you um, today with a few little extras thrown in as well. So the first topic we're going to cover are those all important statutory payment increases. Uh, there are three key dates to be aware of for this April. So we'll go through all three of those for you. We're then going to move over and have a look at IR35. So we're going to explore a little bit on what IR35 is and what we can be doing to prepare for the reforms that will come into effect from this April. We're then going to move on and have a look at right to work checks. So with Brexit um, and the end of that transition period, how that has impacted really. We are then going to almost um, rewind 12 months and look at the good work plan. Um, so just a bit of a recap there and a refresher on some of the key bits of legislation that came into effect last April to be aware of. We are then going to, um, Hannah and I are both going to go through some key case law with you. So we've got one case each that we're going to share with you that's really important just to, to keep on your radar. We will look at some future developments. So this could be employment um, law that will be coming up within the next couple of years and also some things as well that are, are currently in consultation um, around uh, legislation changes. And we're going to end today's session by having a little recap on the Chancellor's budget from a couple of weeks ago and how that will impact furlough um, and your, your requirements really. We'll also have time at the end to have a Q&A session as well. So we are starting today, as I said, by having a look at the national minimum and living wage increases. Now, these are all effective from the 1st of April uh, this year, so just next week. And there are two considerations this year. So as usual, we have the, the increases to the hourly rates, which we'll have a look at in a moment. But something else to be really aware of and something that has been um, a little bit overshadowed, really, and, and not been publicised that much is the fact that the age range is also um, changing. So to be entitled to a national living wage, previously um, it was for employees who were 25 years or older. That's actually um, being reduced to 23 years. So if you have team members who are 23 years and over, they will be entitled to the national living wage with effect from the 1st of April. So in consideration of that as well, the rates are increasing. The rate for the national living wage is increasing to £8.91 per hour. That's also, as you can see, had a knock on impact to the, the next age bracket. So the next age bracket is our 21 to 22 year olds, and that has increased to £8.36 per hour. Any team members age 18 to 20, it's increased to £6.56 per hour. And anybody under the age of 18, they will be entitled to the new rate um, of £4.62 per hour. We also have an increase to the apprentice um, hourly rate. So previously that was £4.15, um, but that's now being increased from the 1st of April to £4.30. So very key one to remember, 1st of April, the increases will be effective from and also that key um, important bit of legislation with the age range as well. Now, you'll probably remember from the session content, I said there were three key dates in April to be aware of, 1st of April being the first one. And I'm going to hand over to Hannah now, who is going to go through the other two key dates in April for you to keep in your diary. Thank you, Sophie. And I think that was a really good point you made about the um, change to the age for national living wage. I don't think there's been much publicity about that. So quite an easy one to overlook if you're not aware. Yeah, definitely. 
Now, as Sophie mentioned, the second key date to be aware of is the 4th of April. Um, from the 4th of April, that is when family friendly pay is changing. So this is things like your statutory maternity, paternity, adoption and shared parental pay. That will be increasing and it's increasing to £151.97 per week. The third and final date to be aware of is the 6th of April. So from the 6th of April, that's when statutory sick pay is increasing. So that is increasing to £96.35 per week. Also from the 6th of April, redundancy pay is increasing. So this is the maximum weekly pay that can be used when calculating redundancy. And that's increasing to £544 per week. And the final um, change that's happening on the 6th of April to be aware of is the increase in unfair dismissal. So this is the cap on the amount of money that an employment tribunal can award for a successful claim of unfair dismissal. And that is increasing to £89,493, so a really substantial figure there. There is also a second cap with unfair dismissal to be aware of, and that's 52 weeks salary. So that could be quite a lot less, um, but I'm sure you'll appreciate still either way, it's a substantial sum of money. So definitely want to avoid where possible. Mm, certainly very very hefty penalties there. And, and as Hannah said, ones to certainly avoid um, where you can. So we're going to move on and focus for the next couple of minutes on IR35 and some up and coming reforms that you may not be aware of. So IR35 is essentially a piece of legislation with the main aim of reducing and eliminate, eliminating sorry, unlawful tax avoidance. And that is resulting from an individual status as self-employed within the practice or business. And it's in relation as well to the tax and national insurance contributions. The legislation was first introduced back in April 2000 into the public sector. And the new and updated legislation was actually due to come into effect um, last April, so April 2020. But due to COVID and the, the ongoing impact of the pandemic, it has been postponed by 12 months. So it's now due to come into effect from April 2021. The new legislation is going to shift the responsibility for medium and large businesses in the private sector for them to ultimately be responsible for determining the status of their team members. Now, previously and prior to, to April, the onus has always been on that self-employed individual to make that decision. So it's an important one to, to be aware of because it's something that will be the responsibility of the the, um, the employer going forward. So to help us with our responsibility, Hannah is now going to talk us through some really useful tools and some tips to help determine the status of your team members. So there are two main tests for self-employment that will be used by a court if there were to be a challenge. And the first test is mainly around the uh, contract that that is in place with that individual. So, for example, is it genuinely a self-employed contract? Does it have all the key elements to determine their self-employed status? And one of those is a locum clause. So the ability to provide a substitute rather than completing the work themselves. That's one of the key tests of being self-employed. What we have recently done here at Agilio I team, um, we have worked with our solicitors to um, review our self-employed contracts to check that they are IR35 compliant and also update them as well. So for all our iComply and IT members that are joining us today, we we'll definitely recommend that you have a look at um, the new contracts that we've released on iComply a couple of weeks ago. Look through those changes there. If your contracts are sort of several years old, they don't have the key clauses such as the local clause I mentioned just a moment ago, we'd definitely recommend updating them there in line with that as well. Now, the second key test for self-employment, and probably the most important test, is how you treat that individual on a day-to-day -day basis. So the level of control that you have over that individual. So with your self-employed team members, there should be less control. They should have more autonomy, more flexibility there in comparison to your employees. It's even including things like leave. So how do you manage leave your self-employed team members? Is it the same as your employees? So it's really about making sure that there's differences in how you treat those individuals individuals to protect that self-employed status and that is the key thing that a court would look at to determine that self-employed status should it be challenged. 
Now, HMRC do have a useful online tool that you can use to help determine that status, and that's the CES tool, the Check Employment Status for Tax tool. This is an online tool where there's a series of questions. A lot of them are related around the ability to substitute, provide a locum, but also um, how you treat that individual on a day-to-day -day basis. So you go through those questions. There is quite a few of them, but once you get to the end of those questions, HMRC will give you an assessment as to whether they believe that individual would be employed or self-employed for the purposes of um, tax. So a really loose, useful tool that HMRC have there that I'd recommend having a look at. Now, in terms of the penalties for non-compliance with IR35, as Sophie mentioned, the um, legislation has been delayed by 12 months because of COVID, um, and it's now being implemented next month. But those um, penalties are actually not going to be implemented for a further 12 months. So the first 12 months from next month when IR35 is implemented, there's going to be a break in the penalties. The only exception to that would be if it's found that um, a company is deliberately avoiding IR35, then those penalties will be implemented in the first 12 months. But after that period of time, the penalties are going to be largely based around the tax and NI that would have been paid um, should that employee have been a um, employee or should that sorry self-employed team member been an employee or worker previously. So it's going to be the equivalent tax and NI that would have been paid to HMRC. There will also be interest on top of that. If those calculations are also found to be um, misleading or deliberately incorrect when they're made, there will also be further penalties um, per companies, judged on a case by case basis as to that. So potentially for individuals that have been with the company for a long period of time, there could be substantial payments that are due to be made. So I'm just going to hand back to Sophie now, who's going to go through some key steps um, to really make sure you are compliant with IR35. Brilliant. Thank you, Hannah. So just to really reiterate what Hannah said in terms of the next steps and action points is really look at utilising the tools available out there for you. So the, the gov.uk CES tool is a, a really useful one to, to have a look at. Also, look carefully at the contracts that you have with your team members, ensure they're compliant and they are reflective of their status within the, the practice and really have a think about how you're treating your team members. So can you say that there is a, a clear definition and a clear degree of separation between how you treat your self-employed to how you treat your employed and your workers? And something that we will touch on again throughout the webinar when we're looking at case law is just how important that that treatment is. Um, it's all well and good having really robust contracts in place, but you really need to ensure that you're treating your team members as self-employed individuals. So we're now going to move on to right to work checks. So with Brexit, there are some changes that are due to take effect in relation to right to work checks, and they are going to be effective from the 1st of July this year. So there is a bit of a grace period there. So at present, up until the end of June, you can continue to do your standard right to work checks. So looking at things like EEA passports and ID cards to confirm that team members right to work. However, from the 1st of July, that will be changing. Now, the government haven't confirmed exactly what those checks are going to look like um, from the 1st of July. What we're anticipating is it's going to be similar to what it is currently, um, just different types of documentation that you'll need to source. So definitely want to keep an eye on for the future. But at the moment, the government have some really useful tools that you can use to help check your right to work for your team members. Now, the first one is a right to work checklist, and this is available on gov.uk. And it's basically a manual checklist, a document that lists all the um, suitable information that a team member can provide to confirm that right to work. And that's one of the documents that we're anticipating will probably be updated in line with those changes from the 1st of July. The um, other thing that they have is an online question tool. So very similar to the online tool that I mentioned just a moment ago for IR35. It's basically a series of questions that you go through. You answer information about the documents that you have to check that team member's right to work. And at the end, it will give you an assessment as to whether those documents would suffice for the purposes of right to work. 
The final online tool is in relation to settled or pre-settled status. And Sophie in a moment is going to go into a bit more detail about exactly what that means. But this online tool is similar to the um, DBS update service if you use that. And you have a code given to you by your team member that you input onto the settled and pre-settled status um, portal. And that will give you information about whether that individual has that right to work in the UK, whether they have the settled or pre-settled status. So I'm just going to hand over Sophie now to go through what that means in a bit more detail. Great, thank you. So the EU settlement scheme, it has been designed to offer EU citizens who are living in the UK before the end of that transition period, the opportunity to protect not only their residents, but their right to work in the UK after that transition period came to an end. So if you're currently employing or engaging with team members that are either EU EEA or Swiss citizens who don't already have the, the indefinite leave to remain, the likelihood is that they are going to need to look at applying to the EU settlement scheme. What they are going to be applying for is, as Hannah said, either pre-settled or a settled status. And that only depends on how long they have lived um, and resided in the UK for. So if they have lived um, in the UK for five or more years, they are looking at applying for a settled status. However, if they have lived in the UK for less than five years, they would be looking at applying for the pre-settled status. Now, in terms of employment and right to work, either status will give that individual the right to continue to, to both live and work in the UK past the 30th of June deadline. Now, the EU settlement scheme is, is live, it's open um, and ready for applications. The deadline for the scheme is, is fast approaching, really, and that's coming up on the 30th of June. Now, the guidance to employers currently is that you can remind your team members um, about the, the up and coming deadline. But what we can't do right now is um, ask for evidence that they have applied to the settlement scheme. Now, as Hannah mentioned, um, sort of linking back to the new checks that will be effective from the 1st of July, there is potentially going to be some legislation or some kind of um, advice from uh, the government in terms of whether or not you need to look at retrospective checks for your current team members. But that's something that still hasn't been confirmed just yet. So just moving on to um, a sponsor licence. So you may not have ever heard of a sponsor license before, but if you wish to employ um, or engage with EU nationals from outside of the UK after the 1st of January this year, so after that transition period came to an end, you're going to need what's called a sponsor license to legally do so. A sponsor license is issued by the government there is a very stringent um, and quite a strict process to follow and an application um, to follow in order to gain that type of license. You also, um, so not only is there an application, but you also have to, to meet a set of ongoing criteria in order to, number one, gain that license and also to keep it as well. The EU national uh, wishing to come to the UK to work will, as I said, need to be sponsored by a UK employer under that new immigration based, um, it's a new points based immigration system, sorry. So you're going to need to look at having a sponsor license um, sort of a, as soon as possible if this is something that you are looking at um, and also look into the, the points based immigration system to ensure that the types of roles that you would be looking at uh, recruiting for would be applicable under that, that system as well. Now, the penalties for getting any of, of the above wrong are incredibly high, actually. Um, and they're split into two different scenarios. So the first one is what I would say deliberate and the second is more negligent. So the first one is if you knowingly employ somebody who did not have the right to work in the UK um, and you knew that or you had reasonable cause to believe that they didn't have the right to work in the UK, then you could face jail and be ordered to pay a, an unlimited fine if you are found guilty. The second um, sort of scenario is if you are more negligent with your checks. So that could be that you haven't done them 
them properly, you've not used the correct checklist, for example. And if this happens, you may get what's called a referral notice. And that will just let you know that your case is ultimately being being reviewed and looked into. And you may also have to pay uh, what's called a civil uh, civil penalty fine. Um, and that could be for up to £20,000 per illegal worker. So I think you'll probably all agree um, we need it's something that we really need to take our time over, um, ensure that we're getting it right to avoid that type of, of penalty going forward. Definitely. I think the penalties are so severe there. As you said, it's definitely worth sort of making the time to ensure it is done properly. In terms of next steps, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the government haven't confirmed um, to, um, exactly what those checks are going to look like from the 1st of April, and um, sorry, from the 1st of July. So you definitely want to keep an eye out for to see when that is released. And that's exactly what we're doing here within Agilio as well. We're keeping an eye out for that documentation. The other thing to make you aware of for our iComply members that are joining us today, we do have a document on iComply. Um, it's called Engagement of Non-UK Personnel. And we are currently working with our solicitors to update that document in line with these new changes. So have a look out for when that is released on iComply as well. Perfect. So just um, going to almost rewind here. So let's take ourselves back 12 months and think about the good work plan. So we're going to focus on this for uh, a couple of moments, really. And for those who aren't aware, the good work plan, it all started way back in 2016. Um, the government commissioned a gentleman called Matthew Taylor to carry out what it called a review of modern working practices. That later became known as what you will hear referenced as the Taylor Review. So the Taylor Review uh, consisted of 53 proposals for changes to current employment legislation and 51 of those changes were accepted by the government and implemented with the majority of them coming into effect from April 2020, so April last year. Now, you will be forgiven for not remembering every single one of those 51 changes, um, because I'm sure you will agree, COVID and the pandemic just completely overshadowed it. Um, it all seemed to happen all at the, the same time. So we thought it would be useful today just to run through some, some, some of the key parts of legislation that was updated um, that will affect you and your practices, and ones that we do also get quite a lot of questions on the helpline about. So the first key piece of legislation that had been changed was the entitlement, sorry, <clears throat> the entitlement to a contract. Prior to April last year, the entitlement was within the first eight weeks of employment. But the Taylor Review, which shaped the Good Work Plan, recommended that really for, for the contract to be useful in any way and to enable that that team member to make informed choices, then it should actually be a requirement to be issued on day one at the latest. So with effect from April last year, it's legislation um, and an entitlement for both employees and for workers to receive their contract um, at the very latest on day one of their employment. That leads us on as well to a, a second reform to, to contracts. And really the Taylor Review looked at um, in order for a contract to provide clarity and to be useful, the mandatory information that was contained within a contract needed to be extended. The extension now covers points such as the job duration, if it's a fixed term contract, for example, the details of a full remuneration package, if you implement a probation period uh, for new starters, details of that needs to be clear in the contract. Full work patterns should be stated, so that's the hours um, and the days of the week, as well as any paid leave that they're entitled to, and also a really clear indication um, and clearly stated notice period uh, requirements in there as well. So our um, Hannah mentioned earlier that our contracts for self-employed team members have recently been updated and the same goes for our, our employed contracts as well. So the iComply and iTeam contracts cover all of the mandatory information required and are fully compliant after they were reviewed just a couple of weeks ago. So we implemented some changes on the advice and guidance of our solicitors and they are now on iComply ready for you to adopt and adapt. 
Now, the next key change, just to make you aware of, is really um, key, I suppose, for more casual um, flexible and flexible and also seasonal workers, really. So the Taylor review, again, highlighted that there was a, a slight unfairness, really, in the way that holiday pay was, was previously calculated. So this is important that it's holiday pay, not holiday entitlement we're looking at here. So prior to April last year, the legislation for calculating holiday pay was that it must be based on a 12 week average if your hours um, and your pay fluctuates. The reforms from April, um, April last year, um, is that you now need to comply with a 52 week average for calculating holiday pay. So it's something to be aware of and ensure that you are adhering to that new legislation of the 52 week average if you do have team members who are more casual, kind of zero hours or, or seasonal workers as well. And again, another reform that's predominantly aimed at fairness for, for workers like casual workers and, and your zero hour contracts is that they now have the right to receive a detailed payslip with both the hours of work and the pay references um, detailed within this payslip. So this may have already been something that you were doing um, as a standard, but if not, it's something that you need to, to start doing straight away. And again, it's probably uh, predominantly thinking about casual workers here or perhaps even employees actually that do regular overtime. Um, and that's that they now have the rights. So workers and employees have the right to request a more stable and more con uh, sorry, a more stable and more predictable contract. So this is to ensure that um, there's fairness uh, across the board. So things like your zero hours contracts, just to put this into context for you, if you have somebody on a zero hours contract, but actually they they do really work maybe Monday to Wednesday every week, um, they do have the right to request that those hours are contained within their contract to ensure that that contract is then more predictable and more stable for them. This could also go for employees, perhaps, who maybe work regular overtime. So this could be every, maybe they're asked to work every Saturday or, or a late night every week. If this is something that they are regularly doing, they have the right to request that that is also contained within their contracts. So one to be aware of if, if you do um, engage with that kind of um, flexible working. The next area of reform to be aware of, and that's the breaks in continuous service. So prior to last April, if you had an employee or a worker who left employment and had a one week break, their continuous service and the associated rights with your length of service would be lost. However, from April last year, so April 2020, the break has been increased to four weeks. So this change will probably most likely benefit your casual workers who perhaps have regular assignments with you or, um, you know, are, are kind of working on and off between contracts. Um, it will stop them from ultimately losing their continuous service each time a new contract begins. Another example um, to put it into context, to context sorry, is perhaps if you have maybe made a team member redundant if you actually have a reasonable alternative role and offer that to them within the four week period, if they then um, are, are re-employed, they would continue, they would, sorry, they would keep their continuous service with you. So that break would not be applicable and their um, ultimately their start date from their original contract would apply. And the final just, um, piece of sort of update to make you aware of that came into force from April last year was the fact that the good work plan increased penalties for employers really that are repeatedly breaching employment law and their employment obligations. So there has been two reforms here, the first one being an uplift in the financial penalty for aggravated breaches. So this is repeated breaches and the uplift in the financial penalty has gone from 5,000 to 20,000 pounds. And this will apply to employers who have perhaps previously lost um, employment tribunal cases on very similar, um, very similar reasons. It will be issued by a tribunal 
it's payable to the court so not to your employee um, and it will be payable on top of any compensation that your employee has been awarded the second um, update and reform really is around what's called naming and shaming so naming and shaming again came into force from april last year and it is something that is now um, information in the public domain and again, it's really targeting and coming down on those employers who are repeatedly breaching their employment law obligations. So it's ultimately a, a list of names in the public domain that could very, very potentially impact on things like your, your recruitment for new team members. All you would have to do is Google the, the name of the practice. Um, and if things like that start to show in the search results, that's really going to potentially put off new recruits. Um, and as you can imagine as well, you know, if your if your patients even are are googling yourself and they see that kind of um, repeated breaches to employment law, then they may think twice about about coming back, perhaps. So really, quite um, quite hefty penalties to to think about there. So just moving on um, from the good work plan and we're looking at some case law now. So there are some key cases um, on the screen now that Hannah and I are both going to take it in turns talking you through um, some ones that are, how, are really quite out there at the moment in terms of being heavily publicised. Um, so I'll hand over to Hannah, who is going to talk through the Uber case with you. Thanks, Sophie, and I would absolutely agree. I think both of the cases that we're going to talk through today are potentially going to have um, sort of ramifications and impact going forward. So the first case I'm going to talk through is the Uber case, and that's an employment status case. So this has links with IR35 and self-employed status that we mentioned earlier. So in essence, some Uber drivers challenge that they weren't self-employed. They were in fact either employees or workers. Now, this has recently been determined by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court have ruled that indeed they are not self-employed, they are in fact workers. And this judgment was mainly made around the basis of the amount of control that Uber had over um, those drivers there. And because of that level of control, it was deemed they weren't self-employed, they were in fact workers. So going back to what we were talking about a few slides ago, it's really important to treat your self-employed team members differently to ensure that that self-employed status is protected. Now, what that's meant for Uber going forward is that now their drivers are entitled to um, holiday pay, uh, other statutory payments, so statutory sick pay, maternity, paternity, those statutory payments that we mentioned at the beginning are increasing, but also they're entitled to um, national minimum wage or national living wage. So potentially that's going to have a huge knock on impact to the business as a whole there really. And I think this is one of many cases that has come about recently. So you may have also heard of um, a couple of years ago, there was a case, Pimlico Plumbers, and that was also a similar case where the self-employed status of an individual was um, challenge there. So I think potentially going forward, we're going to see much more cases that are very similar to this with the employment status of self-employed individuals being challenged. And I think particularly for the dental industry, it's one definitely to be aware of and um, sort of keep a close eye on because of the potential implications that could have due to the amount of self-employed team members. If there is a challenge in the future, it may have a real impact to the industry. So definitely one we're keeping a really close eye on um, here because it could have a huge impact there. Yeah, certainly. I think it can just almost be a bit of a domino effect sometime, can't it? Sort of with the Pimlico Plumbers case just a, a couple of years ago, really. Um, I think it could quite potentially open up the, the floodgates there. So the second case we're going to look at um, involves an employer called Falcon X. Now, this is a really very interesting case and one that could quite potentially shape case law relating to COVID and to furlough going forward. The case really centres on the claimant, who is an ex-employee of Falcon X, alleging that they were forced to continue working whilst being placed on the government furlough scheme which is a direct breach of that scheme, um, the scheme that was in place to support businesses if they didn't have that work available. So if, if the pandemic was affecting them so much that they weren't able to continue um, with the hours to their team members. Now, the claimant raised, um, so the claimant, the ex-employee, raised concerns to their union and after raising those concerns, they were actually made redundant by Falcon X. So the claimant's union is now push, um, 
pursuing a claim for unfair dismissal, for unlawful deduction of wages and for breach of contract against um, Falconex Limited. So while there's not an awful lot of information on this case just yet, what we can what we can probably assume is that the unfair dismissal is in relation to the redundancy process. So perhaps they are claiming it's an unfair process because it wasn't a genuine redundancy, for example, or maybe parts of the procedure weren't followed um, to the, the ACAS code. The unlawful deduction of wages is, again, this is just potentially um, could be linked to the fact that if that, in, that individual was furloughed and only receiving 80% but continued to work, then they would be at that 20% detriment if Falcon X didn't meet that. So that could be the potential unlawful deduction of wages. And then the breach of contract um, is a little bit more difficult to, to give you um, some kind of indication on just because we don't know what was in that team member's contract. But it could well be that actually it was more of an implied um, contract term that was breached. So the implied trust and confidence between an employee and employer could potentially have been have been broken due to the fact of what Falcon X were alleging to have asked that team member to do. Now, it's really important here that I do let you know, um, Falcon X have strongly denied all of those allegations um, um, and sort of publicly put out a statement to that effect. But it is certainly going to be a very interesting one to, to, to keep an eye on. Um, at Agilio I team, we will definitely be doing that um, and we will be keeping you updated as and when we do employment law webinars um, and just employment webinars really throughout the rest of this year. Absolutely. I think, um, as you said, with the self-employed one, Sophie, I think that's potentially going to open the floodgates as well for more COVID related claims coming through. I think we might see a real increase in them going forward. Yeah. So some other future developments to um, make you aware of. Now, the first one is neonatal leave and pay. Now, this has been confirmed that it will become legislation. The details around exactly what it will be when it's implemented are still yet to be confirmed. But what we believe is that it will be implemented in 2023 and all parents would be eligible for this. And they'll be eligible if their um, baby is born prematurely or if potentially when the baby's born, they're unwell and in hospital for a period of time and at the moment it's believed that period of leave will be up to 12 weeks in addition to the statutory leave already in place so for example maternity leave and there would be statutory payments associated with that again so again similar to your statutory maternity and paternity pay um, so you definitely want to be aware of the future and once those details are confirmed as always we'll keep you updated with those now, a couple of other potential legislation that might come into effect. Um, the first one is pregnancy and maternity redundancy protection. Now, this one has not been confirmed yet. It's something that's been consulted on at the moment, and there's currently a bill going through Parliament. So the current level of protection for ladies who are on maternity leave in a redundancy situation is that they have um, preferential treatment for any suitable alternative employment. So any vacancies that you may have um, as part of that redundancy process. However, the proposal with this legislation is that that protection will be extended and that would be extended throughout the duration of the pregnancy the duration of the maternity leave and for six months after they return to work as well. So a lot longer period. It's also been proposed that the level of protection is going to be extended to the extent that potentially redundancy might not be able to be made during that time. So you might not be able to make an employee redundant during that period of time. So potentially it could have a real significant impact on employers. Now, as I mentioned, this hasn't been confirmed at this stage. This is something that is going through Parliament and they're looking at sort of both sides of the story, really, the potential impact that that could have to employers as well. So I think that is a really substantial one there. So you definitely want to be aware of and keep an eye on for the future. Another type of um, legislation that again is being consulted on but hasn't been decided on yet is carers leave. Now the proposal is that employees will be entitled to a week's unpaid leave to undertake um, caring responsibilities and we believe that's going to be a week per year as well. Um, again it's not been confirmed it's something that's being consulted on at the moment but it's another one that we're definitely keeping a close eye on because um, it could have an impact to future employment. But I'm sure you've noticed throughout those um, three types of 
of legislation that are either being implemented or being consulted on. They're very much based around the family friendly types of leave and supporting those employees there. And that very much has links with the good work plan that Sophie mentioned earlier. That was one of the things that Matthew Taylor was heavily looking into and um, recommended there really. So I think potentially going forward, we're going to see more um, legislation of this kind being implemented. Mm, brilliant. I certainly agree, Hannah. And I think the redundancy protection um, that's being consulted on is going to be a huge impact on on employment, you know, everywhere really, isn't it? It's going to be one certainly that will have a, a really big impact if you're looking at restructures, redundancies. So it's going to be interesting to see how that will actually transpire and, and happen in practice, really. Um, so just having a look at the last two future developments we, we have for you. So the first one being the potential um, impact on post-termination restriction clauses within employment contracts. So the government are currently reviewing restriction clauses within employment contracts. They are looking really to see if it is actually achieving legitimate business interests and also how reasonable they are to enforce. Now, the, it is currently in consultation um, and they are considering one of two options. Um, first of all, abolishing them completely. So just making post-termination restriction clauses um, completely unenforceable. Uh, or secondly, they are looking at considering possibly placing what, what you would call statutory time limits on them. So it could be that they actually look at putting a across the board a limit of you know maybe six 12 months perhaps um, on any post-termination restriction clause within an employment contract so both of those um, sort of pieces of consultation are being looked at at the moment um, so I don't expect any new laws or legislation to be in place um, very imminently but obviously that will if it if it does get accepted that will have quite a, a big impact on drafting employment contracts going forward so it's something that we are definitely keeping an eye on here and we will implement with the contracts on i comply if anything does need to to change there and the final uh, future development one that I'm sure we'll have all um, heard of it has been in the news and in the press so much recently, and that's the COVID-19 vaccination. So at the moment, the COVID-19 vaccination is voluntary for all individuals, and that's including um, frontline healthcare workers. However, there are quite a lot of speculation about whether this will change in the future, as it's been alleged that NHS executives are currently looking at whether whether or not they make the vaccine mandatory for frontline healthcare workers. Um, Hannah has actually wrote a whole article dedicated to this um, on our Agilio software website. So if you do want to have a read of that one to get a bit more information, then, then please head over there. What we are currently recommending at um, Agilio I team is that practices encourage their team members to have the vaccine where possible. Um, just provide them with as much support and information as you can where they are raising concerns. So it's really about helping them, helping them to balance their, their individual opinion, I suppose, with the their kind of like their professional responsibility and duty. So it's a, a fine line to and a, and a fine balancing act to achieve. But we'd really recommend that all concerns that are being raised are, are really listened to and, and treated with due consideration and also really consider each individual's um, circumstance as well. So there may well be reasons that could be linked to protected characteristics, for example, that is resulting in them ultimately not wanting to, to take that vaccination. So if you are looking at the, the news at the moment, we have... We have some companies that are possibly stating that they would like to make the vaccine mandatory um, for their team members. They are looking at changing their current contracts and changing new contracts to ensure that there are clauses in there to protect them. But what we really need to ensure is that this isn't discriminatory in any way, because if a team member is not taking the COVID vaccination due to perhaps their age, their race, religion, gender or even a disability. So if they're not taking the vaccine because of those types of reasons um, and we are, you know, 
enforcing some kind of action on them, then we are potentially under the, the realms of um, being in breach of the Equality Act there. So it's something to take into due consideration and only do if it's absolutely necessary and after you get some, some really legal advice on how to implement it. Another risk really of enforcing it on your existing team members is the fact that if you are updating their contracts, you need to ensure that you are following a, a very stringent consultation process with them, that you are engaging with them on adding that term to their contract as well. So if that team member um, is very resistant and doesn't want to sign up to that, that contract on offer, then you're in the position if they resign off the back of that of potentially looking at an unfair, um, unfair constructive dismissal claim. So there are quite a lot of risk around this. Um, so please do tread extremely carefully if you are looking at going down that route with it. Um, so I'm just going to hand back over to Hannah now, who is going to finish up today just by having a bit of a recap on the Chancellor's budget from um, a little bit earlier this month. Thanks, Sophie. So in addition to the statutory payment increases that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there were a few other announcements from the Chancellor's budget at the beginning of this month. And the first one's in relation to the coronavirus job retention scheme and furlough. So furlough has now been extended until the end of September there. And there will be some changes though going forward to the payments. So at the moment, the government will continue to contribute 80%. However, from the 1st of July, those payments payments are going to be changing. So from the 1st of July, employers will be required to contribute an additional 10%. So the government will continue to top up um, the 70% there, but employers will be required to pay 10% on top of the existing NI and pension contributions that you're already making. That will again change from the 1st of August. And from the 1st of August, employers will be required to contribute 20% as well as the pension and NI contributions. And the government will contribute the remaining um, 60% there. So that will continue to decrease throughout the period. There have also been some slight changes to the eligibility criteria. So at the moment, employees who were employed um, on or after, or on or before, sorry, the uh, 30th of October 2020, providing that an RTI submission to HMRC had also been made by that date, they can be furloughed under the present scheme. That's changing from the 1st of May. And from the 1st of May, any employees who are employed on or before the 2nd of March, again, providing that an RTI submission has been made to HMRC, they will be eligible for furlough going forward. So definitely one to be aware of there. There have also been some changes to the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme, SES. Um, so that has now been confirmed that a fourth and fifth grant will be available under those schemes. There has been a slight change to the eligibility criteria. So the tax year 1920 will now be taken into consideration as well. However, unfortunately, the rest of the eligibility criteria does remain in place. So a lot of dentists will not be eligible under that scheme. Um, but it might be worth looking into depending upon those changes for the tax year there. Some other really exciting um, announcements that were made as part of the budget were in relation to apprentices and trainees and a lot of additional funding and support available for them. So in relation to your apprentices, first of all, the incentive payments for apprentices is increasing and that's increasing to um, £3,000, so it's doubling there. But also there has been talk about a flexi apprenticeship type scheme. Now there hasn't been much detail released about what this will mean, but from what we understand at the moment, it sounds like apprentices will be able to work at um, a number of different employers. So potentially a dental nurse apprentices might be able to work at a number of different practices there. So definitely want to look into for the future, it might be really useful. There's also been a lot of money put aside for trainees. Um, again, we haven't got much detail about that, what that will look like, but it's also something we're keeping an eye on as to whether that would be something that's useful for the dental industry. Um, so lots of things that's ongoing in the future, really, um, to look into lots of things we're keeping an eye on to help support you all there.